Well, I think we've got everything packed, and Nancy's upstairs unplugging the toaster. And I guess we're ready to go. But in case anyone's wondering whether this trip is necessary, let me say a word or two about what we hope to accomplish. In meeting with the industrial democracies in Versailles, we should see more clearly where and how we mean to have a better economic future. And the NATO meeting in Bonn, there we'll have a chance to explain in detail plus or our plans for engaging the Soviet Union in realistic arms reduction talks. So that's my reason for going. And I can only tell you that I shall be more proud than I've ever been of anything to be there representing the United States with an opportunity once again to express to all of them and to the world what it is we think we represent, what it is we want for all the people of the world. It was President Reagan's first major trip abroad, a tightly scheduled nine-day visit to France, Italy, the United Kingdom, and West Germany. And despite a rainy beginning in Paris, the trip would be marked by significant developments, among them a major U.S. troop reduction proposal to complement Mr. Reagan's earlier arms reduction initiatives. The official welcome by French President François Mitterrand came under clear skies the next morning, beginning with Mr. Reagan's review of the guards at historic Élysée Palace. The president had scheduled two days in the French capital. He wanted to assure himself adequate time both for talks with Mr. Mitterrand and to prepare for the trip's first major event, the economic summit at Versailles. Lunch in the early 18th century splendor of the palace, which was once owned by Madame Pompadour, was strictly a stag and private affair. Mr. Reagan later declined to go into specifics about what had been discussed. I just want to take this opportunity to thank President Mitterrand and the people of France for the warm hospitality uh, that we have enjoyed and are enjoying here. So, merci beaucoup. The Palace at Versailles is possibly the most famous in the world. The eighth economic summit of leading democratic nations was described by the press as the most lavish ever held, a red carpet affair that even Louis XIV, who built the palace, would have admired. President Mitterrand and other heads of government were determined to press Mr. Reagan for a reduction in high American interest rates, which they say strengthened the dollar at the expense of other currencies and helped weaken the economies of European nations. British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher was among those who appealed to Mr. Reagan. His reported reply, in working sessions not open to the news media, was that the interest rates were down from their high by 25%. He said they will drop further soon, as his domestic economic initiatives strengthen the American economy. For his part, Mr. Reagan urged fellow conferees to stop using bargain interest rates to promote trade with the Soviet Union. Helmut Schmidt of West Germany, among other European leaders, had rejected earlier American pleas for reduced trade with the Soviets. Representing Japan at the summit was Prime Minister Zenko Suzuki. Other participating nations were Canada and Italy. After two days of meetings, the conferees officially agreed in a communique that interest rates are too high. There also was acceptance of reduced trade with the Soviet Union. U.S. Treasury Secretary Donald Reagan was pleased. I think we accomplished what we set out to do. Remember, this is the first time that the seven leading nations of the Western world have agreed and set down a record that they will limit their dealings, their financial and economic dealings with the Soviet. When the work was done, the summit partners and their wives celebrated in Louis XIV's Hall of Mirrors, made magic by candlelight. They crowned the evening with fireworks. Next morning, after an early flight from Paris to Rome, 
President and Mrs. Reagan began another extraordinary day of ritual and glamour with a drive to the Vatican. The President and Pope John Paul II met privately for 50 minutes. Then Mrs. Reagan, Secretary of State Alexander Haig and others joined them before they spoke to the media. As you know, Your Holiness, this is my first visit to Europe as President, and I would like to think of it as a pilgrimage for peace. The very condition of the world today calls for a far-sighted policy that will favor peace in our day. The next stop in Rome was Italy's presidential palace and a visit with President Pertini. A special message Mr. Reagan had brought to his Italian counterpart was further thanks for the rescue of U.S. General Dozier from terrorist kidnappers. Two hours later, another country, England, another palace, Windsor Castle. And here the welcoming head of state was Queen Elizabeth II. As she, President Reagan, Mrs. Reagan, and Prince Philip looked on from the reviewing platform, the Grenadier Guards helped establish once again that no one is better at pomp and ceremony than the British. The President's and the Queen's mutual love of horses led them to an early ride the next morning. A chance, as it were, for a relaxing private conversation on the trail, at least as soon as they were beyond the ears of the reporters and the eyes of the cameras. The day marked one of the high points of President Reagan's journey. He became the first American president ever to address a meeting of the Houses of Parliament. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President Reagan. The president urged Britain and the world to join America in a new crusade for freedom by encouraging the spread of democracy everywhere. Thank you very much. The objective I propose is quite simple to state. To foster the infrastructure of democracy, the system of a free press, unions, political parties, universities, which allows a people to choose their own way, to develop their own culture, to reconcile their own differences through peaceful means. We invite the Soviet Union to consider with us how the competition of ideas and values which it is committed to support can be conducted on a peaceful and reciprocal basis. For example, I am prepared to offer President Brezhnev an opportunity to speak to the American people on our television if he will allow me the same opportunity with the Soviet people. Me. I have discussed on other occasions, including my address on May 9th, the elements of Western policies toward the Soviet Union to safeguard our interests and protect the peace. What I'm describing now is a plan and a hope for the long term the march of freedom and democracy, which will leave Marxism, Leninism on the ash heap of history as it has left other tyrannies which stifle the freedom and muzzle the self-expression of the people. The second major address of the president's tour came a day later in Bonn. But first, a ceremonial visit with West German President Karl Karstens. <laughs> then on to the Bundestag, where he was warmly received, and in return promised steadfast American support. A national effort entailing sacrifices by the American people is now underway to make long overdue improvements in our military posture. The American people support this effort because they understand how fundamental it is to keeping the peace they so fervently desire. We also are resolved to maintain the presence of well-equipped and trained forces in Europe and our strategic forces will be modernized and remain committed to the alliance. By these actions, the people of the United States are saying we are with you 
Germany, you are not alone. Mr. Reagan had a special message for anti-war protesters marching elsewhere in Bonn. To those who march for peace, my heart is with you. I would be at the head of your parade if I believed marching alone could bring about a more secure world. Those who demand that we renounce the use of a crucial element of our deterrence strategy must show how this would decrease the likelihood of war. It is only by comparison with a nuclear war that the suffering caused by conventional war seems a lesser evil. Our goal must be to deter war of any kind. The president then made the most significant new proposal of his European trip, urging force reductions by both Eastern and Western Europe. In recent weeks, we in the Alliance have consulted on how best to invigorate the Vienna negotiations on mutual and balanced force reductions. Based on these consultations, Western representatives in the Vienna talks soon will make a proposal by which the two alliances would reduce their respective ground force personnel in verifiable stages to a total of 700,000 men and their combined ground and air force personnel to a level of 900,000 men. Mr. Reagan's chief aim at the following day's meeting of the NATO alliance was a united front to back the United States in its arms initiatives with the Soviets. He wanted agreement that negotiations succeed only from strength. But the first order of business was to add the Spanish flag to the flags of the 15 other NATO countries. Spain has just become a member. Musicians played as the 16 heads of government and their staffs gathered. The alliance leaders discussed all three of Mr. Reagan's major arms negotiation positions for strategic arms negotiation talks, or START, for his zero option solution on medium range missiles, and for mutual reduction of troop strength. The leaders then gave the president what he had asked for, full backing for the entire negotiating package. And in return, he supported their call for genuine detente with the Soviet Union. In Berlin, the last major stop before heading home, Mr. Reagan was greeted by many GIs from the 6,000-man Berlin garrison and by members of their families. Before visiting the Berlin Wall, he said he had questions for the Soviets. Why is that wall there? Why are they so afraid, afraid of freedom on this side of the wall? In fact, I may stuff the question in a bottle and throw it over the wall when I go there today. The president then viewed the wall from a point known as Checkpoint Charlie. As he looked into East Berlin, he said the Russians put up the wall because they know freedom is catching. The wall, he said, is as ugly as everything it stands for. A crowd of 20,000 West Berliners waving American flags later applauded Mr. Reagan when he spoke to them in their native tongue. The Berlin bleibt doch Berlin. Berlin is still Berlin. Within hours thereafter, following nine exhausting but productive days, the president was back home again, setting down at Andrews Air Force Base near Washington. Ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States and Mrs. Reagan. Mr. Reagan's message for a welcoming group of American officials complemented the message he had taken to Europe. What he had learned there, he said, is that America is not alone. In an interview at the State Department in Washington, the impact of President Reagan's European visit was discussed by Hugh Seide, Washington contributing editor of Time magazine and two high-ranking department officials. Robert Hormatz, Assistant Secretary for Economic and Business Affairs. Reasonable means of resolving these differences. And Richard Burt, Assistant Secretary designate for European Affairs. Mr. Seide first talked with Mr. Hormatz. We're back in Washington now after that rather remarkable journey. 
Mr. Hormatz, and so let's talk about some of the results. Naturally, we like to rate them. That's one of the first things. How did you rate this summit meeting? Well, the, the summit came off quite well, I think. Leaders managed to reach agreement in many areas. Some of the agreements were harder than in others, but I think they managed to address the issues head on and to come to some type of an agreement in almost everything they dealt with. Was that first matter of President Reagan as leader, as the man who brings the most to a meeting like this, has the most wealth and, of course, underlies the defense. Some doubts about him, whether he understood policy, economic matters. How did he conduct himself and how did they react to him? The president came in with some strong ideas about what he wanted to get out of the summit. He pushed them very effectively in my judgment. And I think as a result, uh, we got uh, agreement in a number of areas that were very important, not just to us, but important to the West in general. I think he came in with an attitude that what we need out of these summits is not a victory for any one country or any small group of countries, but progress which moves the West forward, which strengthens Western economic partnerships. If I read the comments right at the end, he didn't quite satisfy those who were very upset about our high interest rates. It's probably true that there are still some doubts as to whether the United States can get its interest rates down. I think those doubts largely surround whether or not a consensus can be reached between the executive branch and the Congress on the question of a, of a budget resolution. Was there not some pressure put on him, though, to do more? A number of people uh, did raise the point that it was particularly important that he and the Congress work out a compromise in this area. And this was a concern in the minds of a number of leaders, and I think the President took this as a very constructive comment. Or one of the other things, of course, that came up is this desire to stabilize the currency markets, mm -hmm. and uh, that was one of the principal issues. Now, mm -hmm. what came out on that? Was there anything that you see that actually advances this? There were two, two elements which I believe are important. One, we agreed to undertake a study to look at past exchange rate intervention to determine when it has worked and when it hasn't, to get a better sense of, of what we can do and what we can hope to achieve in the area of exchange rate intervention. And we have an open mind with respect to this study. Second, uh, work has been um, undertaken or will be undertaken very soon to try to develop a, a greater sense of cooperation among the major economies of the West under the context of the IMF to try to set medium-term economic policy objectives in common with one another so that they can encourage one another to achieve uh, stable economic growth over the, over the medium term. And that, too, will have, I believe, if convergence occurs, a stabilizing effect on exchange rates. We also have made a, a particular point of indicating that we did not uh, take the view that we should never intervene uh, to counter disruptions in exchange markets. On the contrary, the view was reinforced that when there are disruptions in currency markets, uh, we will from time to time intervene. Uh, we've done it once before, and we did it uh, just a few days after the summit um, to help to stabilize currencies. I see. One of the other issues, of course, is this matter of credits to the Soviet Union. Mr. Reagan, as you well know, would like to tighten that vice a little bit and bring a little more pressure on them. Well, you're right. We didn't get uh, as far as we would have liked in that area. We believe there is a problem here. There's a problem that we have, first, the third largest economy in the world, the Soviet Union, which should not receive subsidies paid for by Western taxpayers. Two, at a time when the Soviet budget is increasing, the military budget is increasing, it is not in the interest of the West to, to provide, through government support, uh, credits which ease the Soviet economic pressures. It's not, a, it's not aimed at economic warfare. It's simply saying that the West should not be subsidizing the Soviet economy, particularly when subsidizing the Soviet economy or helping them out through government credits makes it somewhat easier to increase their military expenditures. And when they increase those military expenditures, we then have to increase our own military expenditures to compensate, and that uh, costs more taxpayers' money in the West and leads to uh, increasing budget difficulties in the West. You're still going to press for that? Yes, we, we believe it's important. There were some concerns about free trade, as you well know, the, yes. building, the building up in this nation of some kind of protectionism sentiment, and particularly on the matter of steel. As sure. you know, we have the court Absolutely. cases going along on that. Uh, were there any, was any of the poison drained out of that? I mean, do you, can you reconcile these various national interests? I, I must confess, I didn't see much that was done this the, time. 
Several things that. were done in the trade area. First, I think, as you correctly point out, trade problems remain. And yeah, trade, they were there before you went. They were there before we went, and they weren't all resolved at Versailles. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. And trade pressures really remain a very vulnerable element of the world economy today. Agreement was reached to try to strengthen the GATT system, the international trading system. Agreement was reached to make concrete progress in the upcoming ministerial meeting of the GATT, which will take place in November, to improve the trading system. There was also a discussion of the bilateral trade issues. There was a concern expressed in, among some countries, or by some countries, that the Japanese really need to implement credibly and promptly the trade package that they announced just before the summit, and to make some improvements in that, recognizing that there are some elements of that package which are promising, but a number of countries indicated that improvements would be desirable, indeed necessary, and that prompt and effective implementation was important. This matter of the human element of just getting these people together, you emphasize that in your answers over and over. Terribly important in this time. Very much so. I think that it's important that the citizens of our countries understand that our leaders are working together and not at cross purposes. It's also important because the partnership among these countries is central to the world economy. If these economies can't work together properly, the world economy is not going to work very well together. And I think that the proof of the pudding in these summits is not what is said in the communique as so much as what is done as a result of what is said in the communique. That is follow-up. And that is really the critical stage now that we really follow up credibly and promptly what we have agreed to do at Versailles. One final question. The fact that economics has become so important that now nearly dominates these summit meetings, even though they're talking... There are talks about defense and that. That would indicate a tilt in this world if we allow it to happen, wouldn't it, towards more peaceful competition, marketplace competition? I think so. I think that to the extent you can develop a, a rational way of resolving problems, problems are always going to be there in the economic area. They result from competition, and there are always frictions. The real question is, can leaders manage these in a constructive way? Can they work out reasonable means of resolving these differences? You mentioned trade. We still have problems in the area of steel and agriculture between the United States and Western Europe. The important point here is that we proceed according to the rules, the international rules of the GATT, and that we manage these in a constructive way. And we don't let problems in one area, such as steel, uh, spill over to sour the climate or reduce the possibility of reaching agreement in other areas. That we manage these consistently with international rules and try to work these out. And I think this is really the spirit of summits, cooperation, and credible follow-up, which puts uh, some meat on the, on the bones of what was agreed to in the communique. Ah, thank you. And on to Pebble Beach next yes. year. Thanks. <laughs> Mr. Beginning Burt, his interview I'm with Mr. Byrd, Mr. Seide asked what President Reagan had done in Europe to dispel his image in some quarters as too much of a hawk. I think that uh, it's, there is no one image of the president in, in Western Europe, and uh, depending on how well the people in question or the journalists in question uh, uh, knew the man. I, I think that what they needed to do, though, was seem, seem uh, in the flesh. The, the leaders needed to sit down and be able to talk to him about a wide range of issues. Did you gain a little more cohesion among these diverse nations? I, I think that, this that any meeting. honest appraisal would, would have to be that we did. You know, it was only 18 months ago, a year ago, that uh, you, every article one read about the alliance was either use the word crisis or disarray. And I haven't seen either of those two words used to describe the outcome of this meeting. That's Did he succeed, and I believe this was one of the true goals of the trip, in becoming a part of the peace movement, or at least uh, co-opting some of that uh, sentiment that's rising all over the world to uh, talk more of peace. And, I and think he, he co-opted it successfully in the sense that uh, when he was stood before the German Bundestag and he said, you know, if he could be part of these uh, marches, that he would be part. Uh, he would be at the front of these marchers. But he went beyond, I think, just simply co-opting the peace movement. I think he's tried to redirect it to some extent to focus on the real problems, which is not simply the desire for peace, but as, as the president put it, peace with justice and liberty. He reminded the Western Europeans of some core values and beliefs that bind us together and that have to be part of our approach in dealing with the Soviet Union and are necessary parts of Western self-confidence. Mr. Burt, uh, could you list uh, for us some of these initiatives that are coming up in the whole negotiation process in sure. the next few months? There are really four principal arms control initiatives now that we have, we have launched. First of all, 
these negotiations on the intermediate range nuclear forces, which we began last November, are now in their second round and, and uh, will continue through the summer. Secondly, the strategic arms negotiations, those are the negotiations that cover the intercontinental forces of the two sides, and they will begin uh, in Geneva at the end of the month. Thirdly, we have this new, fresh approach to conventional forces in Europe, and we will be, uh, hopefully very soon with our allies, presenting a new draft treaty in Vienna where those negotiations are taking place. And then lastly, this, this new initiative, the so-called Berlin Initiative that the President talked about when, when he visited Berlin, and that is so the nuclear confidence-building measures. And these are efforts to reduce the risks of, of a nuclear war by giving, exchanging more information between the two sides, uh, maybe upgrading the hotline, taking steps along these lines. What about some of the specifics? For instance, the proposal to reduce troop levels over there. Is that going to get any place? Well, it's too soon to say. You, uh, this all goes back, and I think this would be one sort of overall theme I'd want to stress. We shouldn't look at the President's visit to Europe in a vacuum. It's really the culmination of a year's effort, really, to put together an integrated security and arms control approach. And last November, you might remember, when he introduced his arms control proposal for intermediate range forces, he said we would have a proposal for strategic forces. And he said we would also have a proposal to cover conventional forces in Europe. And this was the specific proposal. We think that it's time for a fresh approach. We've been hung up in those negotiations for eight years. The primary problem is still one of, of being able to agree on the data, that is the overall number of Soviet and Eastern European troops that are actually in uh, the guidelines area that's under discussion in those negotiations, and that's still going to be a formidable obstacle. But we've demonstrated good faith now. We've come forward in this area, as in the strategic arms area, with our own initiatives. Now it's time for the Soviets to respond. They seem somewhat upset at Mr. Reagan's visit. Why? I think that they've had it easy, really, for the last three or four years in Europe. They've had their own peace offensive. They've been taking political initiatives. And, and frankly, uh, I think the West, we in the West have been somewhat lackadaisical, both in the United States and Western Europe. And now we're answering the Soviets. We're not answering them in a confrontational way, but we're coming forward with initiatives of our own. And now there's something of a, of a battle for ideas underway, and we think we can win it. But uh, you talk, I guess, basically about what the President called a crusade for freedom. And the imagery has been terribly important in this, uh, this whole uh, episode. Uh, you'd say that that was established pretty well. I mean, here is a man who is leading a crusade, somewhat like the old Eisenhower. Uh, well, I, I think so. You know, one of the messages we wanted to get over to the Allies and to the American people is that you know, our security policy and our Western alliance is not just a, a, a marriage of strategic convenience, but that there are some ideas that bind us together. And we shouldn't be ashamed of those ideas, that those ideas have relevance for people in Eastern Europe. They certainly have relevance for people in Poland. And those ideas have relevance for the, uh, for the Third World. See, one other thing that's very broad but on everybody's mind is the, uh, I guess, the likelihood of major war. Uh, is that diminishing despite all of the other conflict around the globe, the smaller wars and that? Is it less likely, do you judge, in this time? I think it, I think it probably is. Uh, there is a great interest and concern about the prospect, pr prospects of a nuclear war. But you know, the fact is, is that deterrence, east-west deterrence, has worked for over 30 years. And we've seen over 100 conflicts in the third world. I think that we can manage deterrence responsibly. We can manage it by maintaining a military balance, and that's what uh, NATO leaders agreed to do, and we can manage it through efforts at arms control. So I think the likelihood of a major conflict is going down. What we have to do is continue to keep a very close watch on it. There's going to be no major breakthrough in this area. What it really requires is persistent negotiation and persistent efforts to maintain the military balance. What is your next major effort now? To keep the alliance together and to push this process of peace forward. I think we have two things we want to do to follow up from the, from the President's visit. One, I think we need to maintain the new consensus we have on a balanced approach to negotiation on the one hand and the maintenance of the military balance. And secondly, we want to get our allies to also recognize that their economic relationships with the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe are, have, a, have a political factor themselves that needs to be factored into our overall U.S.-Soviet relationship and East-West relationship. Any new symmetry for Mr. Reagan? Not, not in the immediate future. Not to me. You're going to rest him up here and take him back later That's on. That's right. I see. Fine. 
Mr. Burt, thank you very much. Thank you.